Yeah. No. We're here. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Joe, once again for braving that. Um, but I was telling Kay, and Kay and I have been praying for a little while. I'd really like to get a music person in here. Um, we need it desperately. And so keep praying for that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jay. <laughs> I tried. I just love those songs. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It encourages me. <laughs> yes. All right. So, uh, again, we're going to have Wednesday night Bible study. Please come if you feel comfortable to come. And uh, then we'll do that for a couple weeks. And then we'll start Sunday school. And we'll be all right back at it. Does that sound good? And so we're just going to ease into this. Um, again, the windows are open today for ventilation. I was just telling them earlier. Uh, that's okay right now. There's going to be a day I'm going to close and put on air conditioning. <laughs> I'm not going to do this all summer. Uh, earlier, we we uh, wiped down with um, those what are the Clorox things. We wiped down all of the uh, song books. Um, and we'll probably maybe do that again next Sunday. And then we did spray all the pews with Lysol. And so what we're trying to do is just make people feel comfortable and safe if they come here. And uh, that's our goal. And uh, the governor, again, said that he thought churches could teach everyone how to be responsible through this. I took that challenge, and we're going to do this. And uh, so we're trying to do the best that we can. So Wednesday night, we'll have a Bible study. We'll continue in Ezra. We are now finishing up our study on You Failed, Now What? This is the last sermon on this. And, uh, and then we're going to get into five characteristics of a successful church. Five characteristics of a successful church. And if you wanted to, you can actually apply these characteristics and the five characteristics of a successful Christian, but a successful church. And so that's where we're going to get into that. I'm not sure if I'm going to get them all in one sermon, or two sermons, or five sermons. I haven't broken it down yet. I was telling Kay, and I'm going to start working on probably this afternoon. I've got the five points. <laughs> that's all I got. So we'll see how it blows up, okay? But, uh, and that's what we'll do the next one. We are on... Five people, and I had a sermon a few weeks ago about the heart and the different soils and how the soils represent the different hearts. And I said that the next people we're going to study about who failed, the, the main issue was their heart was wrong. They had a bad heart. Now when the Bible talks about your heart, it's not talking about that thing that pumps blood. Okay? Uh... And we tell people, you know, I tell Kay, I love her with all my heart. That doesn't mean I give her my heart. I, I can't live that way. All right? So what does that mean? When we use, even when we use it in that sense, we say, of all that's me, the very essence of me is my heart. Or if you want to, the very center, the very core of who you are is your heart. So when the Bible says that some people's heart are wrong, it's talking about the very center of who they are, the very core, uh, not the outside of it. Because a lot of us can put up a good faith, can we? And I think we've ran into people that are fake. Uh, you can do it at work, you can do it at church, there's fake people everywhere. They put up a good used car salesman. I'm sorry, my dad, I can say this, my dad used to be a used car salesman, okay? Really, a lot of them are really, yeah. oh, so, they don't, they don't, no, they don't care, they just want to sell a car. And so a lot of times they've got this crust of faith, and the very core of them, I want to sell a car. And they'll tell you and say whatever they want. So when the Bible talks about your heart, it's talking about who you are in the very essence. These people we're going to talk about, we talked about Saul, and Saul changed, his heart changed. It's a scary thing, and when we really, we should really study it even more and really get involved in that. That's what can happen to us. His heart changed from trusting God and being faithful to God to trusting himself and being faithful to himself. And it was just a subtle change. 
Just because he had a little bit of success here and there, he began to shift. And the very core of him became to trust. He still had the, uh, you know, the air of God and, and talk about God, but in the very core of him, he depended on himself. And he began to live by his own rules. And so his heart changed. These five people we're going to talk about, the very core of who they are, and I know it's five people, and I'm not going to preach an hour and a half, I promise. Okay? And we'll get through it. These five people, the very core of who they were, were bad. Which led to horrible failures. And so if you learn anything today to be successful, and again, and we'll go over this again next week when we talk about being a successful church. Success, our definition of success is fulfilling God's purpose for your life. If you fulfill God's will for your life, His purpose for you in your life, you are successful. No matter what anybody else says. Um, I don't know, I'm going to tell the story. There were missionaries who went to Ecuador. And they tried to reach out to these people, the Ecuadorians, for the Lord. And, and they were, one was a pilot and, and, and things like that. And sign, I mean, they were brilliant men. And people were telling them they were wasting their time and they were wasting their life. But they needed to be successful. And that success was fulfilling God's will for their life, their purpose for their life. They finally reached out to these people and they began to communicate with them. And, and, and if you ever read the book, Through the Gates of Splendor, you should read it. Through the Gates of Splendor. And these missionaries were reaching out to them. And eventually, one day they went to speak to them and they didn't come home. Eventually they found their bodies drifting down the river full of spears. Now the world would look at that and say, what? Failure. They failed. They didn't reach anybody. They died. Complete failure. They didn't start any ministries. No one got saved. Did you know when that happened, the story made national news? People volunteering to be missionaries went straight, I mean, skyrocketed. This is in the early 60s. And that's why we had the big boom of missionaries in the 70s. There's a success by somebody fulfilling their purpose that God wanted for them. Not only that, their wives stayed. And they began to continue to reach out to the people that killed their husbands. I think their life showed an example, and isn't that a success? And they created churches, and people got saved. Because these Indians knew, they were called Indians, or whatever they want to call them, they knew they killed their husbands, but here they are, still reaching out to them. One woman, one wife, actually uh, got to minister and evangelize, and one of the Indians that actually killed her husband got saved. Great success. But the world would look at it differently. So when we talk about being successful, we're talking about fulfilling our purpose in God. What God has for us. By the way, everyone in this room, God has a purpose and a plan for. It. And it's up to us to fulfill that. Everyone. Well, I'm not very smart. I, I can't talk very well. Or I don't have any talents. Baloney. Remember this. God has given you all the abilities and all the talents that you need He's brought all the people into your life that you need to be successful in His will. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to do this, and then say, now I want to see how you're going to get it done. He doesn't do that. Basketball coach. It's easy. We're, we'll bring this up a lot, okay? You don't just tell the team, I want you to play a certain defense, and then never train them and never set it up and never give them the... It just say, go do it. What do you mean, coach? God's the same way. 
And you've been educated your entire life for this moment. Did you know that? For today, this service, everything that's happened to you in your life is for right now. Use it. But Mike, there's been some horrible things in my life. You don't think there's people out there that have been through horrible things? Are doing through horrible things that could use you right now? You have a certain insight that I don't have. Everything in your life has brought you to this moment. To be successful, you have to fulfill God's will and purpose in your life. When we get to heaven, because remember, what do we live, 80 years? I'm going to be about 180, okay? And then we have eternity, right? Everything that we do here on earth for God will be success. That's all that matters. God's not going to say to you, I'm glad you made a lot of money. Woo, look at this guy. I mean, when we, when we get to heaven, Bill Gates and I will be judged the same. You ever notice that? He's got gazillions and a lot of power. Don't matter to God. God will ask the same question. Did you fulfill my purpose for your life? All of us should want to be successful in the purpose that God has for us and the plan. And if you're not sure what it is, someday I'll have a class on this, but get into prayer with God and ask God, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that... But listen, the easiest way to fulfill God's purpose in your life, ask yourself, what am I good at? Well, nothing. We ain't good enough. No. <laughs> you're, everybody's good at something. What is it that I'm good at? Carving. Then use that for God. And listen to me. As you begin to use the talents God has given you, it, doors open up. Things happen. God says, finally, you're using the talent I gave you. Now listen, I want you to use it over here. Now, sometimes our plan and our thought are not the same, but we're using the talents God has given us. Great, I'm off, that's awesome. Over here now. And use those talents. God didn't save us just to sit there and do nothing. And so we're going to talk about five guys. I know it's a long introduction. I won't take super long. We're going to be in Proverbs. I should have said that in the first place. Proverbs chapter 4. And I'm going to start on verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So that's why I brought this verse in. Again, protect your heart. When we talk about your heart, your very core, the very essence of who you are, protect it. Do what you have to do to keep it pure, to keep it right, to keep it on God says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. The Bible talks about, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you put in there, whatever it is, it comes out. It'll come out by your words, it'll come out by your actions. I watch people, ask Kay. <laughs> I watch people. People, a lot of people think Mike is just doo, 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 doo. this is me. Oh. No, I watch. And I listen. Because you'll tell me who you are. You will. Because from the bottom abundance of your heart, the very core of who you are, the very essence of your heart, the mouth will speak. And your actions will show it. I know who you are. Protect your heart. Because what you put in there will come out. Oh, you can be fake for a while, but then when somebody really bothers you and you're really angry, all that ugly, filthy language will come out. 
And oh, I'm sorry. Not, I don't know where that came from. That's not really. Yes, it is. You said it. That's in there. That's who you are. You can fix that. But that's who you are. Or you're about to get in trouble and you pull out of your heart a lie. And then you go back and say, God, I don't know why I lied. That's not who I am. Yes, it is. Because it was in there. The very essence of who you are. Protect your heart. Keep your heart. Because out of it comes the issues of life. Out of it comes, comes our words. Comes our actions. The very center of you, who you are comes out. It always comes out. Verse 25, let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Stay on the path. Stay on it. Keep looking forward. Uh, the Japanese have a word, kanban, which means continual progress. Continual progress. Continual proof. And that's what the Bible teaches too. It's not how fast you get where you're going. Are you continually going forward? The church is it continually moving forward. In your life, you know, even your home, is it continually progressing? Uh, somebody gets, I, I've done addiction programs for 16, 17 years now. And what I've learned is addicts say, I want to give up, and they want to be done right over here. Just give me a couple days, and I'll, you know, I'll be done. No! It took you 15 years to be where you are. You think you're going to get over it overnight? No. Very, 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 somebody, well, I know somebody who just, that's, that's unique. But make progress in your life. Keep going forward. That's what it's saying here. Protect your heart because out of it comes you. Keep forward. Keep looking at your goal. Keep looking at your, uh, your task, what it is you need to accomplish, and keep progressing. Maybe I get a big step here. Maybe I get a few babies. But I'm still what? Progressing. Keep your eyes on your goal. You want to be successful in life? Have a goal and go for it. Keep moving forward. Keep, I remember the first time I wrote a book. It's hard. It's difficult. And I, I remember somebody telling me, dude, if you wrote two words today, was that more than you had yesterday? Well, yeah, if you... Then after a while, what? Adds up. It's life. Keep moving forward, the Bible says. Keep your eyes set on the goal. God has a purpose and He has a plan. He has a will for you. This is what I want you to accomplish. Keep your eyes on it. And keep taking steps. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Keep Moving forward. Understand where you are. When the Bible says, again, walk in the Lord, that's what it's meaning. Keep moving forward. Keep making progress. Turn not to the right hand and to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Proverbs 4. <coughs> Proverbs 4. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Real quick, we've got five guys. We're going to hit what they did and how they failed and what the key to success is. These five guys, they failed because they were distracted. They let things distract them from their goals. They let things distract them from their plans. And that's why they failed. Their heart was not centered in the Lord. And things easily distract them. Let us pray real quick. Open up and then I'll...
go for these guys. Father, we thank you so much for your words. And Lord, I love how the Bible is so practical. No matter what situation I'm in, if I'm at work, it works. Lord, if I'm in my home, it works. If I'm at church, it works. The, the Bible is meant for us to use and to live by and to use in our lives. And this is a very practical lesson, Lord. Have a goal, have a plan, and go forward. Go to it. And don't let things distract you. And Lord, that's the center of the message today. Lord, we pray that you be with us the remainder of the service. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first guy we want to talk about is Aaron. And the scripture verses are there, and I might just tell the stories for time. Aaron failed because he was distracted by peer pressure. Now, what happened was, is Moses went up into the mountains to get the Ten Commandments. Everybody remember that? And God wrote the Ten Commandments out on, with his finger on some tablets. Um, and as he's up there with God, he was up there for a long time, and the children of Israel said, We want a God like Moses. What? 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 God was their God. But we want, a, we want a God that we can touch and talk to like Moses does. Could they have? Yes. They could. But anyhow, we want like that. And so Aaron began to feel peer pressure. And he said, well, gather up all your gold and your silver. And they gathered it up. And they're all the gold. And they made this golden calf. And they said, Aaron, Aaron said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. This golden calf. And they began to worship it and make music. And God says, you need to get down to your people. They're making me angry. I'm paraphrasing. Then when Moses comes to Aaron and says, why did you do this? He said, because the people. He also lied. I just took the golden stuff and threw it in the fire. And boom, this... This, this cat came out. Nobody, nobody created it. It just came out. Isn't that a miracle, Moses? Wow. No. But the people, the people. I remember when I was coaching Little League my first time. I've never coached baseball before. Played a lot of it. I even played one year semi-pro baseball. I wanted to be pro. Didn't make it. And so I'm coaching it for the first time, and I'm all anxious, and I had these... Three guys, good guys, no, don't get me wrong, they, they meant well. But they kept second guessing me and they kept giving suggestions and after a while they were just like almost insisting that I listen to them. I remember one time they said, oh, we need to infield in because of you know, how slick it is and da 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 and, and they said, hey, everybody come in and I let it happen. You know how many games we won that year? Zero. None. But I gave in because I thought, this is, I've never done this before. These guys know what they're talking about. And because I let them talk me into so many things, that is not me. Not how I coach, not how I do things. You know what I decided the next year? Dude, I can coach on my own and lose every game. So next year, I said, I'm going to do what I feel is right. I'm not going to give in to what they have to say. We made it all the way up to the championship game. We lost, but we made it to the championship game. What was the difference? I didn't give in to the peer pressure. That distraction will always lead to failure. The Bible tells us another story of a man who was a prophet. And God said, go to and prophesy and come right back. Don't go, don't stop anyplace else. Don't go to the left, don't go to the right. Go straight there and prophesy. Come right back. Now what was that God told them? It's pretty simple, right? Go there, prophesy, come back. Don't go anywhere else. Just go straight there and back. He went straight there because God told me to. He prophesied and a great miracle happened when he prophesied the altar that uh, they were worshiping with. It broke in half. Oh, awesome and then so God, somebody said, hey, I want to talk to you. No, no, no. God told me to come straight back. So he comes and he's starting to go straight back. 
This old prophet heard what had happened, sent his son out, and said, God told me for you to come eat with me. And he listened to that old prophet. Because, you know, there was an old prophet, and, and, the, and because of that pressure from him being an old prophet, he went off to the side. Now, what did God tell him to do? Straight there, straight back. He went off to the side, he went off and he had dinner, and then the old prophet had a prophecy. You know what? God just told me, because you didn't obey him, on the way home, you're going to die. You're not going to make it home. Sure enough, he left, he went, and he died. Peer pressure. Do what it is that God has in front of you. It's all right to give advice. It's all right to listen. But if you know this is God's will, and you know it's right, you obey it. No matter what anybody else says. Aaron should have told them, you have a God. He's up on that mountain right now. That's your God. Now, we'll have peer pressure at work or at home or any place. And people will say, you, know, you don't really believe all that stuff in the Bible, do you? Oh, no, oh, no, I don't. You just gave in to peer pressure. I mean, it's subtle like that. Subtle like You don't believe God really believes. And there'll be four or five of them sitting there. And they'll, hey, you go to church. Yeah. You don't really believe God created everything in seven days, do you? Well, I don't. I don't. I'm peer pressure. How many times have we been talked into doing things we know is wrong, but everybody else says, let's do it. Be the person at work and at home, right is right, wrong is wrong. I don't care what everybody else says. Okay, you can go do that. You're fine. Go do that, but not me. I have a goal. I have a plan. I have a task. You're not going to distract me from fulfilling God's will and purpose in my life. You're not going to make me waste five or six years or whatever to get out of the mess because you just distracted me. I'm going to stay on it. I'm going to look forward. And I'm going to keep progressing. You're not going to distract me with that. Peer pressure. I, I always told, and it happened one time, I had a guy who was just getting over some drugs and and uh, he's getting a lot better. And I looked at him and I said, now what's going to happen is your friends, your old drug buddies are going to try to look you up. And they're going to say, hey, I got some free stuff. You want to, let's use it. He goes, no, because I always pay. I said, it's going to happen. And sure enough, just that week, because he called me up, somebody was ringing on his front gate and said, hey, dude, man, I got some good stuff. I got this. Come on down. We'll use And he said, Mike just told me this. Pressure though, because he wanted to be with his friend, was there. Peer pressure. The goal, whatever it is you set in your life, whatever, I mean, the goal could be as easy as I'm going to fix my yard. Don't let things distract you, don't let peer pressure move you. Don't be distracted by peer pressure. And that's how Aaron failed. And he failed miserably. Haman. Haman, again, his heart was completely wrong. Haman failed because he was distracted by his ego. He needed to be recognized. He wanted to be recognized. The king had, and again, I'm going to tell you the story. The scripture verses are there. The king had promoted him and, and wanted everyone uh, to recognize him. And then one day, he's out, and he's about walking, and this Jew would not bow down to him, Mordecai. Mordecai. Wouldn't bow down to him. Why? The Bible says not to bow down to anyone but God. And so he wouldn't bow down to him, and Mordecai got angry. That hurt what? His ego. And so he tricked the king into making a law that all the Jews could be killed on a certain day. You can take your sword and kill them on a certain day. Now, Mordecai did not know that the new queen 
was a Jew. Esther. One of the greatest stories in the Bible. You know one of the funny things about the story of Esther is the name God or God is not even mentioned. But we see how God moves. And I think that's why it's there. To see, see how God just, His hand moves invisibly in our lives. And here she is. She's the queen now. And she's a Jew. And a long story short, Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. So he, Haman began to build this tall uh, place, what do they call it, where you hang people? Um, Gallo, thank you. So you could see it from any place in the city. He wanted everyone to see what happens if you don't doubt, bow down to me, when you hurt my ego. And Haman was now an official of the government, and he could have done all kinds of things, couldn't he? He could have done some great things. He could have, I mean, there were so many things he could have spent his time doing, but he got distracted because somebody hurt his ego and he spent all his time doing what? Trying to get back at the person who broke, hurt his ego. Long story short, at the end, it's so funny and it says in Proverbs, somebody who pushes a rock to crush you, it rolls back on them. If somebody digs a pit, to trap you, guess what? They fall into it. Remember that. If somebody's trying to get at you, just stay faithful to God. The very device that they have set up for you will spring on them. If you let God to work. And so what happened was, is uh, Esther tells the king, hey, by the way, you signed a law saying to kill all Jews. Did you know I'm a Jew? Well, did he want his queen dead? And so he made a new law that you basically you can't, and, and the Jews can. In other words, he made it difficult for you to kill a Jew. And then he said, "Well, who did this?" More, um, Haman did. He said, uh, "Haman, take him and hang him from the same gallow that he had built for Mordecai, so the whole city could see what, instead of, instead of what happens if you hurt my ego." What happens if you touch God's people? Now it's a great story. But he got distracted because of his ego. He had to be recognized and he did everything and anybody who didn't recognize him and made sure they got put down, they were crushed. And instead of being going forward what he could do in life, he let that distract him. Dude, he should have just shrugged his shoulder and said, who cares? I don't care. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be successful. But instead, he wasted all his time because somebody hurt his ego. Have you ever done that? Somebody hurt your ego, hurt your pride, and then you spend the next two or three months wasting time on that. I'm going forward. I'm moving on. I have a goal. I have a task. I have a plan. I don't care about that. I don't care. You can hurt my ego all you want. I know what I'm doing. That's what success is. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care how you put me down. I, I don't care. I've got a job to do. And I'm going to do it. You want to be successful at work, at home, in our church. You want to be successful in your life. God has a plan for you. And there will be people who will crush your ego. They will. They say, you can't do this. Or they'll even uh, not care. I remember, this is going to sound bad, but I worked in a church. And, uh, and no matter what I did, and I... I had to work on this. No matter what I did, this other guy got all the credit. I'm serious. It was the pastor, the associate pastor and assistant pastor. I was assistant pastor. Whatever I did, and I, I trust me, and I'm not bragging, but I did a lot. Then people would get up and brag about the associate pastor. I'm like, what? He wasn't even involved. What? And it would bother me. But I had to push that aside. I really did. And I worked on that. 
and say, no, what's important is the job got done, right? Not who got, not who got the pat on the back, not who got the praise, not my ego. God knows what I did, and God will reward me, and God will bless me. Who cares about my ego? And I really had to, because it would come up, and I'd say, no, put it down. Put it down. Who cares who got the credit? The job got done. Was that not the goal? Was that not the plan? And so, don't be distracted by when people hurt your ego. Your feelings, they will. You get involved with people, no matter, you get a group of ten people, somebody's feelings will get hurt. Somebody's ego will be hurt. Don't let it distract you from your goal and your plan. And then there's Korah. Now I'll tell the story about Korah too. Korah got distracted by arrogance or the need for authority. Korah was <coughs> nobody. Let's be honest. He was nobody. And here was Moses, somebody. And Korah wanted to be what? A somebody. And so, what some people do when you are an authority or you do have a power, there will always be one or two of these people. They want to be a somebody, so what do they got to do? Tear you down. Attack you. No, no, they're not going to work hard and make steps and, and get to that point. No, they're going to tear you down. And he was arrogant. And he says to Moses, you have too much power. And there's others of us here who can do what you do. Or we can, we're just as good as you. And that might be true, but who put Moses in power? God. And he says, I want some power. I want some of, and he got distracted. Could he have done the steps to get there? Could he have not put himself in positions and work? And get educated. Couldn't he have come to Moses and said to Moses, Moses, how can I get to where you are? You could have done that, right? <clears throat> but instead, he got distracted by his own arrogance. I'm just as good as Moses. If not better. And he wanted to put him down. Isn't that what the devil did? Arrogance. Saying to God, I'm just as good as you, and I'm going to put my throne next to yours, <clears throat> if not over yours. Arrogance. And he got distracted, <clears throat> and he failed. He failed miserably. And a lot of people followed him. Be careful who you follow. I'm going to tell you, if it's a negative person, get away. God does not bless that. <clears throat> if it's constantly negative, 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 and, and I can do this better, or we can do this better, negative, negative, I wouldn't put my saddle next to them. <clears throat> and a lot of people did. And God, Moses just says one little prayer. God, he said, everyone who's on Korah's side, get over here. Everyone that's on my side, get over here. God, show us who you want in charge. And as soon as he got done, the earth opened up. And everyone on Coruscant fell in. And the Bible says there were flames. They fell right into, some of us believe, right into hell. And he closed it. <coughs> I don't think that was very successful, do you? He let his arrogance get in the way. And he got distracted by it. <coughs> and he was failure. Don't let your arrogance get in the way of your home. Don't let the arrogance get in the way and distract you at work. Somebody's the boss. And if you're like me, I've had a few bosses I was smarter than. It's just true. There are a few bosses I knew the job better than them. I could not let that arrogance get to me. They were my boss. If I wanted to be where they were, I had to work the system too. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it distract you from your goal and your plan. So that's core. <coughs> well, 
We'll get through this real quick. Balaam. Balaam failed because he was distracted by greed. Greed. They offered him money to curse Israel because he was a prophet. And he kept trying to. Did you notice that? He kept trying to do because they offered him money. I love this. God got a donkey to talk to him. <laughs> Listen to me. If God can use a donkey, can he use you? Jesus even said once, if you guys didn't do it, the rocks and the trees would do it. So don't say God doesn't have a plan or purpose for me. And so he used a donkey and said to him, Balaam, God's going to kill you if you go any further. We read later on in Balaam's life, because he tried to trade Israel away from money. He got distracted by greed. He was a prophet of God. He was. And somebody offered him some money. You notice how money changes people? You ever notice that? That's probably why I can't win the lottery. God probably thinks it'll change me. I would like to see if it would or not. <laughs> money will change people. And they offer and greed. Don't get me wrong. It's all right to have money. It's all right to make money. It's all right to be rich. It's not all right to be greedy. It's not. And he let the greed get to him and he traded the children of Israel for money. And later on we read, there's a battle going on and somebody sees Balaam and you know what they do? They kill him. You know why? Because he was Balaam. You think people forgot that? No. Do you think people forget it if you're greedy? Not just talking man here, just flesh, okay? You know somebody that's greedy and they've done greedy things and an opportunity comes up where, you know, they need you or they need help. Are we more apt to help or say, huh? I know you. It doesn't lead to success. He got distracted. He was a prophet of God. Instead of maintaining his relationship with God, instead of saying, I'm going to stay and keep following God and keep going forward in God's purpose and plan for my life, he got distracted by money and went over here. Failure. Failure. Don't be distracted by money. I have found in my life, if you don't follow after money, It'll come to you. It does. God takes care of his people. He will. And so if you're not following to be rich, some people end up being rich. But I have found that I've always eaten. I've always had food. I have always, always had a place to sleep. I've always, always been taken care of by God. Now, I may not always like what I had to eat. I remember one month I ate a lot of raviolis. But I always had it. I've been poor. I've been a little, well, I've never been rich. But I've had a little <coughs> money. I've been it all. And I've never followed after it. And some people look at me and say, yeah, Mike, we can tell. They're not saying that even I can be distracted sometime by greed. Stay focused on God's plan and His will for your life. Don't let money distract you. And Balaam let that distract him. The greed of it. He wanted it. And a complete failure. Cain. Cain got distracted by revenge. We all know the story of Cain and Abel. Now, what he used to kill his brother, we don't know, but they were, it was time for them to offer a sacrifice. And Abel offered the right sacrifice. And Cain offered what the best of his. It was an arrogant sacrifice. And God rejected Cain's and accepted Abel's. And that made Cain hate his brother. And he wanted to kill his brother. And he wanted to seek revenge on his brother. Had his brother really done anything to him? No. But he became consumed and distracted by revenge. 
Revenge is the only poison you take that hurts, you know, I mean, that you give out that hurts the person, the other person. It, 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 it'll eat you up inside. It'll destroy your life. It'll always lead to failure. To became consumed. And that's all he could think about was revenge on his brother. God even said to him, Cain, go offer another sacrifice and I'll accept it. That should have been on his mind. That should have been his goal and his plan. Whoa, I messed up. All I need to do is fix this. And be back in purpose in the will of God. But instead, it is Abel's fault. We have Christians in our churches that do that a lot. It's because of this person or that person, my life's a mess. No, it's always you. You hearing me? Well, this person said that and they did that. My life's all messed up now. You decided where you are. You make decisions of where you are. It's always you. Always. And you can decide, no matter what happens to me, no matter what person says about me, no matter what person did to me, and a lot of times we make that up, we assume. I remember one time, oh boy, it's just going on, I'm sorry. I remember one time a guy walked into church and there was these two ladies walk, talking and he walked right out angry. And he came to me and he goes, you need to do something about them. I said, wow, what happened? They're in there talking about me. I said, really? How do you know? They're in there, t they were in there talking when I walked in. R really? <laughs> That's not the issue. The issue is, am I staying faithful to God? That's my plan, that's my purpose, that's my goal. I don't care what you said. I don't care what you did. And sometimes you didn't do anything. I just felt like you did. Abel hadn't done anything. Abel was innocent. But Cain felt like he did. And he became consumed and distracted by revenge. <clears throat> Let it go. But you don't know what they did to me. Let it go. Remember. Vengeance belongs to who? God. I will repay, God says. <clears throat> you let it go and let God be God and you be you and you stay faithful. Don't be distracted by revenge. It will lead to failure. Then the, that was the last one. So let's leave the key and then I'll read a scripture verse and we'll be done. <clears throat> the eighth key to success is to stay focused on your task, your goal, or your plan. To, the key to success is to stay focused. When a company loses the focus on their goal, that company fails. When a home loses focus on their goal, their tasks, it will fail. When a church loses focus on their goal, and our goal is to fulfill our purpose in God, it will fail. A Christian who loses focus on their God and God's purpose and plan and will for their lives, they will fail. See, this is a practical lesson and a spiritual lesson. Don't lose focus on your goal. There may be setbacks. That happens. You may take two steps backwards before you can take another step forward. But guess what? There's my goal. Stay focused on your goal. I'll read one scripture verse and then we'll be done. To be truly successful in life, don't lose focus. Don't lose focus. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober. That means stay in your right mind. Be focused in your mind. When you're drunk, you can't stay focused, can you? You ever see a drunk try to open the door? They can't focus. 
Be sober. Be focused. Be in your right mind, it says. Be vigilant. That means don't give up. Oh, I tried. Keep trying. Be focused. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Does the devil want you to be a successful Christian? No. And he sees that you're a little out of focus. You're a little distracted with something. Revenge or greed. Or somebody hurt my ego. He's a roaring He's seeking how he can bring you to failure. And he sees you're a little distracted. I'm going to pounce all over that distraction. I'm going to pull on that. Yeah, look what people say about you. They hurt your ego. Yeah, look at this money you can make. Wow, look what you could do with it. They'll even say, and people say this, if I can win the lottery, they, look what I can do for missionaries. The devil will tell you that. Dude, if you do this, Balaam, if you do this, look at the good you could do with it. Even Judas said that. Judas said, hey, couldn't that money be used? He didn't care about the poor. He cared about what? The money. Be sober. Be focused. Be vigilant. Don't quit. Because the devil is looking for any distraction to tear you up. To tear up your home. To tear up your church. To tear up your nation. To tear up whatever you're involved in. He wants to rip it up. He wants to see you fail. Don't give him that chance. Stay focused on what God has for you. Everybody, everybody, head down, every eyes closed. We're about to have our song of invitation. If anybody wants to come and pray, we'll pray with you. Maybe there's somebody here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I could not think of the There's not a bigger failure than that. To never accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. To never accept heaven as your final destination. That is the greatest success we can have. Is to live with God forever in heaven. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, please come forward and we'll show you how. And today you can have that success. Or maybe there's somebody here that's dealing with some distractions. Their ego's been hurt. Or, or, or they want revenge. Or, Lord, they're, they're thinking about something. They've been offered this big pile of money. And it, it's kind of against their morals. And it's a little bit, you know, unethical. But the money. Lord, I pray. If they need prayer, they come forward. Or today they decide, I'm not going to let that distract me from God's purpose and will in my life. Pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Joe, did you want to try one more time? Okay.